Good morning. Good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to take your Bible out and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 today of Jeremiah chapter 29. This morning, we're going to start a new uh, series entitled Captive. As I was uh, meditating, reading on God's Word, and uh, trying to decide what direction to go, uh, he led me to a passage, this passage, and I was looking at it, realized there was a couple sermons there, and I began to think about what God was uh, speaking to me personally, and I realized that, um, you know, the Bible is full, and we're going to explore the Bible in some different areas of uh, people and, and people in captivity. And uh, the first thing we think of is somebody who is just literally in chains or behind bars or something like that. But really, uh, there's people who are in captivity that seem to be free, but they're, uh, they're chained to something or someone or somehow or something has held them back or held them down. You know, uh, we're going to explore this for the next few weeks, and uh, so captive is going to be the thought process of it. The, the title for today's sermon is Carried Away Captive. Uh, the scripture today that we're going to look at is a time in the Old Testament when God's people had been carried away captive by Babylon. They'd been carried away by the Babylonians. In fact, uh, Israel is proof that no nation is too strong to be carried away captive. In fact, uh, the Assyrians had threatened and uh, caused the Israelites, God's people, a lot of trouble. And uh, the Assyrians seemed to be the world power. Uh, but along came the Babylonians, and at this time the Babylonians began, began to become the world power. And so uh, a lot of this kind of rings true with America. A lot of people, including myself, believe that America is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Amen? But the truth be known, America is not beyond being able to become captive. America is not the superpower without God and His his being and his blessing that would be who we are today. And I think that we're in danger, and I'm not preaching doom and gloom. I'm just telling you, Assyria thought that they were the America of the day. And then all of a sudden the Babylonians rose up. And the next thing you know, they became the superpower. And they began to conquer all these nations, including even God's people. And how could that happen? How could God's people be carried away captive? It happened back in 597 B.C., before Christ. That's why we look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament is before Jesus. And so, in 597 B.C., uh, actually they were conquered in 627 B.C., but they were began to be deported in 597 B.C. So in other words, there was a period of time after that conquer, and they began to carry people to Babylon uh, to, to be held captive. Uh, I would say that the, one of the strongest thoughts I had when I thought about God's people being carried away is they thought everything was going to be great, they thought everything was good, and little did they know that things had slipped into their lives and slipped into their culture and slipped into the nation. And before you know it, they were not where they wanted to be. And I know we can deal with that in our own personal life. Sometimes, all of a sudden, we're not where we want to be. And we're going to look at that today. They were probably filled with many questions at that time. In fact, anybody who's in captivity, for some reason or another, begins to ask questions. And so the same questions that they were asking is the same questions that we ask today. So it's very, you look at the Old Testament and you think, how can this relate to my life? These people, the people of God, are we the people of God? We don't sound too excited about that. I mean, I've heard people get more excited about getting a tooth pulled than about what you just responded. Are we the people of God? If we're the people of God, then we need to live like the people of God, because if not, we can become captive just like God's people back in 597 B.C. And so, so they were probably filled with many questions after being carried away to Babylon, to a foreign place, a foreign land, a place they didn't want to be. They were not where they wanted to be. And all of a sudden, God rose up prophets, and one of the prophets that we read about is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the prophet of God, and at this particular point in time, in verse 29, God had, sent, God had told Jeremiah, the prophet, to send a letter to the captives. 
So chapter 29, and actually it's, it's, a, it's more than one letter, but it's all put together as a recording of the letter of different times that Jeremiah had sent letter to the people. It can be broken down in different portions of Jeremiah t- chapter 29. And verses 1 through 14 is a particular time frame that they sent. We're looking at verses 1 through 10 today. And next Sunday we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. And it was a time when Jeremiah, the prophet of God, and, and, and Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And, and you'll understand why when you read the book of Jeremiah. He did not want to be a prophet of God. He was to be the priest of God. And, and, and his father was a priest, and probably his grandfather was a priest. And a priestly duty was that they went into the temple and, and did the things of God. And they had a certain way and a certain set and all these things that they did. He knew what he would be doing. He knew the outcome. And he knew exactly what the next day would bring. Sometimes in our Christian life, that's the way we want it. We want to know what today brings. We want to know what tomorrow brings. I want to do things the same way that I've always done them so that I know what's ahead. And the truth be known, we, none of us know what's ahead. And Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet. Now, a prophet in those days was not a popular position to have. In other words, prophets of God many times were tortured, they were persecuted, they were laughed at, they were ignored, they were thrown in jail, and they were even killed at the hands of the people. Jeremiah was a prophet of God that was called by God, and he realized that he was to stand up and to begin to prophesy about, you guys got it wrong, you guys need to look, you guys are the people of God, you need to act like the people of God. But this is a time after they did not respond. Because of that, they were carried off captive. And so we're going to pick up and we're going to read this portion of this letter that Jeremiah was told by God to write to to the captives in Babylon. So let's all stand. We're going to read this passage. Starting in verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 29. It says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Chaconai, the king and the queen's mother, the eunuchs, the prince of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths, had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shapana. Chopin. And at Jer- boy, don't you like these Old Testament names, I tell you. Jemariah, J- excuse me, Jemariah, Jemariah, there we go, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar. How would you like to have Nebuchadnezzar to have to spell in first grade? Now, what's your name? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying this. Here's where the letter comes in. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, to whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to, to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in it peace you will have. For in it, in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners also who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely in, your, in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your word, and and I stand upon your word today. Lord, I thank you that we can see in your word, Lord God, a plan and a purpose even in the midst of captivity. Lord, I pray today that you would speak to us through this word. And if there's someone here today that needs Christ in their life, that they would see as we sang so, uh, so powerfully a minute ago that Jesus can set us free. Father, I pray for us as believers that, Lord, sometimes even our, your people, us, God, the ones who belong to you, we can become captive, Lord. 
And Father God, what a, what a hard place to be. And, and Lord, it raises so many questions. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us through this word. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning, here's what I want to present to you from this passage of Scripture, from this text. I want to present to you four questions that people ask when they become carried away captive. Four questions that people tend to ask when they become carried away captive. And we're going to expound upon that. And we're going to see how God's people, and, and, and you can imagine, sometimes we think about God's people, the nation of Israel, and, and we, we, we think about a nation, it's kind of like when we think about America. We talk about America, and we talk about it as a nation, but a nation is made up of people. Not just a bunch of people, it's individual people that come together to form the nation. The nation of Israel was no different. It was many of God's people who were in captivity. So, the first question I want to present to you, and maybe you're saying, you know what, I feel pretty good today. I feel right today. I don't feel like there's anything going on in my life today. Everything is good. I think the sun's shining on me. The rain is falling when it's supposed to. Everything is just great. Well, you're one of the probably few today that say that. But the truth be known, if you look at this scripture text, you can realize how quickly things can change. And also you can realize that even though my life may be good, I probably know somebody who's being held captive by something today. And so I hope we can draw from this these four questions and begin to look at what people ask when carried away in captivity. The first thing, I think, a question that comes to mind is this. How did I end up here? How did I end up here? In other words, I was at point A, and somewhere along the lines, I ended up at point B. I don't know how that happened. How in the world could I end up here? I can just imagine the Israelites, God's people, who were asking that question. How could we be favored by God and blessed by God, and before we know it, we end up here in captivity in Babylon? Most people will ask that question whenever something happens and they feel like they become captive. In other words, point A to point B, how did I end up here? X marks the spot. I don't know where you are in your life, but there it is right there. How did I end up here? There's going to be some point in your life when you ask that. You may be asking that right now. Now, I'm not just talking about a geographical location because sometimes... You look around, you say, well, he must be talking about, you know, how come I live where I live and, I, and, and all those things. I'm not talking just about geography. Because God was much more concerned about the people than he was about where they were in the land of Babylon. A place you don't want to be. I don't want to be here. Now, I hope you wouldn't say that about sitting here in church today. I hope you could say that I'm glad that I'm here. But maybe there's something deeper than that in your life. And maybe there's something that below the surface. Or maybe there's someone that you know that they are not where they need to be. Sometimes things happen. Something that's happened to you and it's now holding you captive. It, it, as I said, it doesn't have to be something that is a geographical location. It can be something physical that is holding you down. It can be something in a relationship that is a hard spot in your life. It can be an addiction of something that all of a sudden, how did I end up with this in my life? If you don't think addictions can happen to Christians, you need to look around because addictions are rampant in the Christian realm. People who begin to follow God and then all of a sudden they end up in a place and an addiction that they had no idea was creeping in their life. Sometimes it can be a financial place. I don't know about you, but I'm not where I want to be financially. I'm glad God is blessing me. But sometimes there's those hard spots in our life, and you think, how in the world did this happen? How can I be here? That's probably exactly what the Israelites were asking. How in the world did I end up here? It can happen to anyone. It can happen at any time. You know, I was looking at verse 1, and I, I began to read this, and this is what God showed me. When they were carried away captive, it says, it says the priests, the prophets, and all the people who were carried away by King Nebuchadnezzar. And as I read across that the first time, it didn't really mean a lot to me. And then I got to thinking, you got priests, you got prophets, and you got all the people. It didn't matter who they were, they were all carried away. 
Even the best of God's people sometimes face points in their life where they say, how did I end up here? Maybe you know somebody struggling with that right now. You know, I believe that that's a fair question to ask, and that's a good question to ask whenever that happens, and that's exactly what I believe the people are asking. How did I end up here? The next thing I want, I believe that people would ask is this. Why, and, and let me ask you this, have you ever heard this question stated? Why would God let this happen? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard, seen somebody that something happens in their life, and they say, why would God let, allow this to happen? And that was probably a fair question in their day. Some people say, isn't God in control of everything? Would you agree with me today? How many of you believe that God is in control of everything? Amen? Amen. If God is in control of everything, why is this happening? Why am I here? And that's a question that we begin to ask. I want to tell you something today, and I want you to listen to what I have to say. And this, is, I believe, is a truth that we need to hold on to during this time and to look at when we say this. Isn't God, 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 aren't you in control of this? And why is this happening? Well, first of all, God causes some things to happen sometimes. It's fair to say that God does cause things to happen. He is in control. He can do what He wants. He can do as He pleases at any time, in any way. Is that true? That's true. And sometimes when we look at that, we have to look at like verse 4. Verse 4, the beginning of this letter, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in fact, God says this, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. God says right there, I caused this to happen. Why would God want this to happen? Why would God allow this to happen? Why would God cause this to happen for His people to be carried away and be where they don't want to be? Sometimes when we look at within ourselves, we realize that God causes things to happen and, and you have to be careful of this and you have to be very careful about how you say this. Sometimes God causes things to happen because of disobedience, because of sin. In fact, the first thing when I end up where I don't want to be and I feel like, God, why did this happen? How could this happen? I need to search myself and say, God, is there something within me that I have done? It could be personal, it could be corporate, or it could be universal. What do I mean by universal? Guess what? You go back to the Garden of Eden, you go back to Adam and Eve, and disobedience and sin entered the world at the beginning of the Garden of Eden. We chose to disobey God. So sometimes things happen and God causes things to happen and God allows things to happen because of sin and disobedience, because of the sin that was brought into this world, because of the sin that is within us, and sometimes it's because of the sin of a nation. Here again, I'm not preaching doom and gloom, but do you think America, that God will turn His head away from America forever if we continue to live in sin? We don't have to look very far. You look at the news media, you look at the, the, the celebrities and all that, they are living in sin. And God can judge a nation because of that. Sometimes it's because of a nation that has fallen away from God. Sometimes it's because of our own sin. Sometimes I have to look in the mirror and say, God, what have I done that I have done wrong? And it becomes with a personal examination of my own life. You see, God caused it to happen. But God does not cause you to always have pain and anguish. Much of it's because of our own sinfulness. Disobedience to God. God may cause some things to happen, but here's what you need to hear. God uses all things that happen every time. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says it very eloquently. Paul says this. Now listen, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, you may want to because this is something that you can hold on to. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know, we don't have to think, we don't have to guess, we can know. Here's what you can know whenever this happens, whenever someone's facing this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Do you love God today? If you truly love God, you have to believe that God loves you because you cannot love God unless God loved you. God wants a relationship with you. God died for that relationship with you. So if you love God, it's because God loved you first. We know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, if you love God, you can know that all things in your life, no matter where you are, whenever, no matter what position, good, bad, ugly, whatever it may be, that if you love God to those who are called according to His purpose... 
God has a purpose for everything going on in our life. He can use all things that happen every time. Anytime we find ourselves where we don't want to be, here's what you don't want to ask. You don't want to ask God, why me? You want to ask God, why this? That's a much better question. Instead of asking God, why me? Why me? Poor pitiful me. We say, God, why this? Why are you? Why is this happening? Why are you allowing this to happen in my life? And you know the answers that God have given me many times about this? It's so that you will know me better. It's so that I can prove my love to you in a stronger way. It's so that I can prove myself. It's so that I can grow you as a believer. The growth that we have in God is the hardest thing to go through. In other words, do you want to be a mature Christian? How many of you want to be a mature Christian in the faith? If you want to be a mature Christian, it takes a lot of pain and anguish to get there. It takes a lot of times when we say, God, why? 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 But never say, God, why me? Say, God, why this? And we begin to look at that from a different perspective. And begin to look at that from a different angle, just as the Israelites needed to. Not, God, God, why me? But, God, why this? Why did this happen? Sometimes it's to draw you closer to God. I don't know how many times, and if you really think through it, some of the hardest times in our life is when you're the closest to God. Some of the, some of the places that are the hardest to be is when you get stronger in the Lord. Sometimes it's trusting God more. And sometimes it's being willing to do what God asks you to do. Have you ever been in a place where God's asked you to do something and you said no? And because you said no, God puts you in a place where you, He gets your attention? Has that ever happened? Am I the only one that God does that to? When God asks me to do something or be something or, or, or act a certain way or, or grow in a certain way and I say no to God, God has a way of getting our attention. And it's not, God, why did you do this to me? It's, God, why did you do this? Why, why did you allow this? And what am I supposed to learn from it? Next thing that we need to ask, not only people ask, why would God allow this? Also, how long will this last? That's, isn't that right? How long is this going to last? Now, I'm not talking about the sermon. I'm talking about this point here. Maybe some of you are asking that right now. How long is this sermon going to last? It'll last as long as God wants it to. I'll tell you that right now. But the truth be known, we ask as soon as we get somewhere, here's probably the better question, how quickly can I get out of this? I'm sure the Israelites, when they were in Babylon, they didn't want to be there. They wanted to be home, but they're not home, they're here. And they were probably asking, how long is this going to last? You know what happened in the text there that I just uh, that, that Jeremiah wrote to, the, to, to them in Babylon? There were false prophets that stood up and said, you know what, this is only going to last a short time and you're going to be right back where you were. There were people who were trying to take advantage of the believers who were in Israel or Israel in Babylon, trying to give them false hope. Has anybody ever tried to give you false hope? False prophets will give you false hope. There's a lot of false prophets today. They'll tell you, if you will just do this, God will do this. If you want to get out of this, you do this and that will automatically happen. God has to do this because you've done that. That is not the way God operates. And the truth be known, how long will this last? It's kind of like this. Whenever my wife asks me to do something for her around the house, I can talk about her because she's not in here. When she asks me to do something around the house, the first question I think is, how long is it going to take me to get this done? What does she want me to do? She wanted to just put a swimming pool in the backyard. I said, no. And she said, yes, we need this. And I said, no. And she said, but I'll take care of it. And I said, no. And she said, but your grandsons can come over and swim in it. And I said, yes. <laughs> how long is this going to take? Sometimes God has us in a position for a short time. But that's not where God had his people. God had his people in a position that was going to last much longer than the false prophets were trying to let them lead them to believe. How do I know that? Look at verse 5. Here's what God tells Jeremiah to tell the people. Go ahead and build houses. How many of you would have built a house if you knew in a year and a half or two years you could be gone? Go ahead and build houses in Babylon. It sounds to me like you're going to be more than just a camp out. My son and oldest grandson, they're on a camp out up at a Boy Scout camp up in Nauvoo. 
And they took a tent and they pitched a tent and they stayed for two nights there. And it said, Eric sent me a Snapchat of Easton standing there in the campground or campsite set up. And it said, home for the next two nights. Now, I'm sure they're enjoying themselves and I'm sure they're having a great time. But the truth be known, they noticed that it's very temporary. They did not build a house. They did not build a cabin. They did not set up for a permanent dwelling. They set up for a short period of time because they knew they're, they know they'll be coming home. But that's not what God told Jeremiah to tell the people. He said, you go ahead and build houses where you are. And you might as well go ahead and plant a garden. And when you plant that garden, you go ahead and prepare on eating the fruit of that garden. And you go ahead and take wives and you go ahead and and have sons and you go ahead and have daughters and you let them marry and things like that. At that point in time, I think if the people were listening to God and listening to Jeremiah, they would say, you know what, we're in this for the long haul. In fact, in verse 10, it tells us how long that they were in for. They weren't there for a year. They weren't there for a short period of time. They weren't there for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. They were going to be there for 70 years. Now, some of you think that is a lifetime. It is. But sometimes when God's trying to get our attention, and sometimes whenever God is trying to teach us, And sometimes because of disobedience of a nation, God can allow people to fall into captivity for a long period of time. I'm not saying that to try to scare you. But that's the truth. Seventy years in captivity is what they were going to stay. It was going to be a long time that they were going to be in captivity. But they had no way out. You know what God was telling them to do? And here's what you need to do. You need to make the best of where I've got you right now. I don't know how many people, and I want you to listen, folks. Because this is probably the big, biggest question that most people don't ask that they need to ask. If God has got me somewhere that I don't think that I should be, or if I'm trapped in something I can't get out of, or if I'm in a position that I just don't know what to do, the best question you can ask is, what do I do now? What should I do right now? I've seen people think if they listen to the false prophets and they listen to the false teachers and they thought we're going to be out of here in a year and a half or two years. So we're not going to set up houses. We're going to set up tents and we're going to plan on being back home within the next few years. And all that time, they're just going to be sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And God is not going to respond because God says this is for the long haul. Do you know what God expects you to do when you're in that position? He expects you to be obedient right where you are. He expects you to live the life that He's called you to live. He expects you to do what God's called you to do. You don't wait for something else to happen. You be faithful to God right where you are. Do you know how many Christian lives are wasted because they don't think they're where they need to be or want to be or something like that? The next thing you know, they've wasted their whole life. I think a lot of times we think something is going to happen this way or that way. We don't follow through because we don't realize that God's got us right where He's got us. So here's three things that I want you to realize that you do whenever you're where you don't think that you need to be or want to be or should be or could be or whatever. First thing is God expects you to be fruitful. To be fruitful. There is never a time in your life... No matter where you are, no matter what's going on, no matter how bad you think it is, no matter how good you think it is, no matter if you're at point A or point B, it doesn't matter. God expects you to be fruitful as a Christian. Now, what is a Christian's fruit? It's love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, the fruit of the Spirit. You can do that no matter where you are, can't you? You can do that no matter what's going on in your life. You can tell people that even though this is happening, God still expects you to be fruitful. God not only wants us to be fruitful, we can also be faithful. They were in a pagan land around pagan people with pagan practices, and the easiest thing for them to do would have been to just fall into that society. They could have just gone with the flow, just like Daniel, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like the ones that could have just easily taken the easy road. And God said, no, you are still mine. You take the high road. 
sometimes we get mad at God and sometimes we think, God, I'm not where I want to be. And so we just say, nope, I ain't doing anything. Sometimes we forget that God wants us to be fruitful and God's trying to teach us something through this. Is there ever a time in your life that God doesn't call you to be faithful? And the last thing that you always want to do, and this is something that no one can live without, you need to be hopeful. You've got to have hope. If you don't have hope, you don't have anything. And if you're putting your hope in someone else or something else or somewhere else, your hope is not secure. You are going to be captive your whole life until your hope is secure, no matter where you are, no matter what's going on, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how good it seems, if your hope is not in Jesus. And you can do that behind bars. You can do that with the worst circumstances going on in your life. You can do that if your physical health is not what you want it to be. You can do that if your family is not where you want it to be with the Lord. You can do that in any job that God has you. You can always have hope. You see, in verse 6, God said, you be faithful to your family. In verse 7, God says, you seek peace no matter where you are. God said, you pray. There's something that this, this world can never take away from you. It cannot take your salvation away, and it cannot take the power of prayer away. They can run God out of schools, and they can run God out of government, and they can run God out of everywhere in society, but they cannot take away the God that we serve and the God that we pray to. You know, my worst fear is, after the elections, everything changed, everything's different. But I can tell you the truth, we can never put our hope in the government. And I'm not saying that to be a Debbie Downer or, or, or pessimistic or anything. I'm telling you the truth, no matter how good and how godly people are, people are not our hope. God is our hope. You see... God says we even pray for our enemies. When's the last time you prayed for somebody who's hurt you? When's the last time you prayed for somebody who's harmed you? When is the last time you prayed for somebody who has got you here and you still pray for them? There's power in that prayer. You see, in verse 10, there's hope. And that hope is no matter how long it takes, no matter what it is, our God is a faithful God and God delivers. You see, today, the truth be known, and Matt, are you going to play for invitation today? Okay, would you come up, please? The truth be known, there is not a single person in this whole church today. There's not a single person who's listening to what, we're, what I'm saying that is not being held captive in some way. How do I know that? We live in a world that is held captive by sin. I want you to focus on God. Don't focus on what's going around here, guys. I want you to focus on your life before the Lord. You see, we're living captive in this world because this world is captive to sin. And even though we live for God, and even though we belong to God, and even though things may be good or bad or whatever, we're still captive by sin. And sometimes, have you ever prayed this prayer, God, how long is it going to be? before this is all over. You ever think about that? God, when is this going to end? God, why is this happening? And the truth be known, it may last the rest of your lifetime. I don't know. But you know in Jesus, now think about this, in Jesus, you still have that hope. Even though you're captive right now, in whatever it may be, even by this world, the limitations... Someday Jesus will take you home. Someday, no matter what is going on in your life, captivity will be over because God will set us completely free. For those of us who belong to Jesus, we know He's coming back. And we know even if it's a lifetime, He will come back and take us home. He will deliver us and He will free us from this world. Sometimes maybe you, maybe right now, you're asking these, these questions. How did I end up here? 
That here may be physically, it may be emotionally, it may be spiritually. It may be a position, it may be a job, it may be an addiction, it may be in finances, whatever it may be. But just know this, you ended up here, but God's still in control. Why would God allow this? Well, God does cause some things to happen to get our attention, but God always can use where we're at to grow us closer to Him. How long will this last? I don't have any idea. Sometimes we want to run and escape. But sometimes God says, no, I'm going to take you through this. And I will be faithful to you. Today, if you don't belong to Jesus, now listen to me. There is no escape for those who do not belong to Christ. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are living in a captivity that nothing else can set free but Jesus and His blood. And someday my fear is this, and I think sometimes we forget this, and I know I hear this every now and then, and I'll preach it when God tells me to, but we don't preach enough about hell and damnation. And the truth be known, if people think they're held captive in this world who don't belong to Christ, the moment they wake up in hell, they're going to realize what true captivity is. How long will this last? It's going to last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. How did I get here? It's not because of God. It's because on this earth you choose not to receive Christ as your Savior. How do I get out of here? There is no way out of here in hell. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior... What do I do? You repent today. You give your life to Christ. He's the only way out of that captivity. If you don't know Christ, this is not a game. This is not going to end when you die. This is going to go on forever. And my prayer is today you give your life to Christ. The reality of hell for so many people on this earth who think that they've got it hard here on this earth is when they wake up and they're in hell forever. believers we go through a lot of things here on this earth you may be feeling held captive by something or someone or somehow today but God says I want to set you free doesn't matter how long it lasts doesn't matter if he ever moves you from the position you're in doesn't matter if you still have to suffer because God wants to set you free and if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. It may be a relationship. It may be a physical ailment or sickness. It may be a family member who's died and you're struggling so hard. It may be that your life just ended up what you didn't expect it to be. But God says, you come to me. What do you do now? Be faithful to God. Be fruitful where you are. And you keep your hope and trust in Him. Father God, we thank You, Lord, for this day. I thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Lord, just like the Israelites so many years ago, they were being held captive. There seemed to be no way out. God, you proved yourself just like you proved to us on Calvary's cross. That you are the true deliverer. That even though we get carried away by our sin and selfishness and sickness and things of this world, Lord, you're the one that sets us free. I pray for one today who needs Christ in their life, that they would come to this altar and pray and receive Jesus. That if you're listening to my voice, that they would bow where they are right now and pray for Jesus to come in and forgive them of their sins. To confess it before you, Lord God, and, and confess that Jesus is Lord and they want them to be Lord of their life. Lord, for us as believers, we may not be where we want to be, Lord, at all times in our life. 
But Lord, we can blossom and grow no matter what. Lord, just help us not to doubt your love for us. Help us not to doubt that you're there. Put our hope in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.